way. And it has a docking interface, which is also very good. We didn't talk much about the fact that when that PARFAR binds to his F, there's a loop there that opens and closes, sort of lets the substrate in. Once it in, it's just like puts the lid on it, keeps it there, right? Opens maybe to dock it to the next uh, component in a reaction. So it's, as I say, it, it, I don't know if that's the real reason. It's a little bit, from the kinetics point of view, it's harder to fold. But it's certainly for its variability and adaptability uh, uh, a really good uh, candidate, right? So having said that, let's remind ourselves again, there's just much more conservation of structure than there is of sequence or a function. So it could be you have a new sequence, right? And perhaps there's not, and maybe through biochemical means, you've got an idea of what its function is, but maybe there's nothing in the structural database that even has the same function. Does that mean you, you quit and, or go attempt to do ab initio? No, you use the fact that the structure is conserved. Maybe there's a, uh, there's a protein does a different function, has the same structure, so I don't really care about its sequence. But this is a very good structure to build upon. But I've just got to find it, and I have to have some measure of that sequence being compatible on here. I showed you what we use. We have a, um, an energy function. If we don't get that discrimination type curve coming up, then we say, well, there's no structure out there. Either it must be a novel structure, and we start again um, and do ab initio folding. Um, if it is a longer sequence, then you break it up and hope you get the same pattern. Uh, maybe you can find at least a domain of it that is similar to something that has existed. So that's the whole strategy that's out there. And then in that case, to get that sequence onto that structure, uh, as I say, you use some kind of threading and measure these interactions with some type of energy function. That's w certainly one way of doing it, right? And then also, as I say, breaking it in to, to into components, into fragments, and, and trying to put those together. So that was one thing that was not clear. <clears throat> OK, uh, well, maybe look for the, let's look at the simpler one. I, well, I hope you guys can see that. Um, I was a little quick about these dendrograms or these structural phylogenetic trees. I think it's clear what I have on this axis are the synthetases from the various amino acids. Um, this is the one letter code for aspartic acid. Um, it's of the archaeal type. Uh, this one is for aspartic acid from the eukarya domain. And this is an aspartic acid from the bacteria domain. So, and w you'll see that you have various amino uh, uh, acyl tRNA synthetases listed here. And on this axis is structural identity. So increasing structural identity here, right? So things, if you're out here, there's less structural identity. This could be maybe the common ancestor to this whole group, or this could be the common ancestor to this whole group. I mean, there are various scenarios you could think, like did it at one time, allow it to dock and load all those amino acids? Or did it just do one and then the others finally evolve from it? Right now we can't answer that. We have to do another part of the study to s make a conclusive statement about that. But that's how you have to view these things, right? Okay. Those little circles? Oh, um, that's the fine print uh, that, uh, no, no, I, I'm joking. Um, uh, uh, this plot, unfortunately, contains a lot of information. Um, we tried to correlate with uh, the study on the catalytic domain, which you remember back from that early picture. Um, you know, there were several different domains. We're just studying the catalytic domain where you load the amino acid. But there's also this other interesting thing called the anticodon region. And as I said, it's not there in all of these guys. And those circles just mean when did it first appear. 
And is it the same? It turns out it's not even the same. Uh, there's one kind of fold, and then in others, there's a different kind of fold. So we're trying to correlate uh, both this, uh, all the regions that make contact with the, the tRNA, because uh, that'll be sort of our, uh, our next focus. Unfortunately, these are plots that are really just out of a paper we just finished and are sending off, and I didn't really have time to adapt them for like a, a teaching environment, which is like simplify, only make one point on a slide instead of four, right? Uh, the usual disaster you get when you're trying to talk about research uh, in a classroom setting. Okay, so I think this was the All right, so as I said from our study, it's, you know, besides helping to give, push back our analysis of these phylogenetic trees and understand what were the earliest amino acids, where things came from, um, make connection with the sequence world, which functions really well uh, once you have a reasonable amount of sequence identity. If you have low sequence identity, you know from just structure prediction that's very difficult regime to work in. So this work is, as I said, uh, really complements the, the work that Carl and his co-workers were able to do. Now, what I wanted to do in the next part of it is first sort of give you a, a, a little bit of a flavor or some of the tools, algorithms that you need, even just to do the simplest thing, <clears throat> like structural alignment. You know, the trouble is with structural alignment, it's not unique if the two objects you're trying to compare are not of the same length uh, or don't have the same number of atoms. And um, so people have spent a lot of time developing techniques to do this. We've uh, uh, looked at most of them. Uh, and oh, if you want to get a fast flavor to them, uh, feel for them, when you are in the tutorial or in the computer lab and you're doing some of the web searches, you can just log into PDB database, bring up a structure, go look at the area called structural neighbors, and you'll see an algorithm will pop up. A CE, it's done by Phil Bourne and his colleagues, and it allows you or um, to compare any two structures that are in the PDB database. Um, Actually, what it does now, I think it just uses a lookup table. They've done it once during what, for one of the releases, and you just keep, up, keep on looking up something. But there is a way to get into this algorithm and ask it to compare any two objects you want to give. And it uses a hierarchical method, and I can give you the reference to it. Another method that we use to do this analysis, because um, when you have very large gaps in structures, this sort of breaks down has been our analysis, so it has sort of for our purposes, limited uh, range of application. We went over and used one that was made available to us by one of our English colleagues, his name is Russell, and it's called STAMP. And let me tell you just a little bit about it. Um, like with most of these things that you're uh, uh, trying to get either a profile from structures or profiles from sequences, you start from some initial alignment or some initial uh, uh, multiple sequence uh, 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 method. So maybe you just take the, for all I care, the sequences of these guys and align them and start, start with it initially to get the thing jump started. Then it goes through some steps, which I, I really won't give the details here, of, of uh, changing this initial alignment and uh, producing a true uh, multiple structural alignment. You gotta be really cautious out there. They're often what they call slave multiple structural alignments. So everything is nicely structurally aligned but to the first guy that you give. So this really does try to adjust it so you have the best alignment among all the, the ones that you give. And it has various criteria that it uses in judging uh, the probability that a sequence, a residue on A, on structure A is equivalent to the, to the one, <coughs> excuse me, J on B. And um, it allows you to have some degree of conformational variation in the structures. 
and it sort of uses um, um, uh, those uh, uh, the distance between these two as you try to start overlapping them. So they're very distant. If they're not matched up very well, then it's a very low probability. If it's a very short distance, then that's a, a, a higher number, okay? And the way that it starts shifting this alignment uh, around is it uses a uh, dynamic programming algorithm, different score function, uh, based more on this, but it's the same kind of principle to sort of adjust things and to produce then uh, this alignment, the structure alignment. Um, when it's all done with uh, moving uh, the structures with respect to one another, you know, applying uh, translations and rotation uh, to them. It also gives you what it was for each member, what are the rotational translational matrices that produce that change. And it gives you also a score, right? And if you want from that score, um, you can then uh, use it to make uh, a dendrogram because it's given an order to them. Um, you may also want to use a different score. We found that it was necessary in doing this analysis to do things really properly. Uh, we went back and used this Q score that we had developed in structural analysis, but with a slight variation. There it used to just sort of tell you about the things that were over the, the portions of it that were aligned well. But it turns out because as you're looking at how these things change with evolution, the role of the gaps, these indels becomes more and more important. And, uh, you know, I asked, uh, 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 when we were discussing this with Carl, he gave this, this great piece of advice that, okay, these insertions and deletions, they should count as a character, but they shouldn't dominate your analysis. Well, that's a general, you know, s uh, statement. And so what we came up with was a measure that evaluates both the things that are aligned and looks at the insertions and deletions and see how much they change the core structure. And because we sort of felt evolution in trying to sort of preserve this functionality, that was probably a, a motivating goal in this. So our, that structural measure we down, have down there is something that, you, to give you the exact details, I'd have to give you the paper uh, of how we developed it. All right, so this is what the output looks like. Does it come from stamp? You can have it in several different varieties and flavors and formats. Um, one that's sort of typically nice, so you can see uh, you have turned that, those structures, like if you remember the structural overlaps that I showed you at the beginning, or the class one and the class two, they're all overlined, but you could read off of that structure uh, a, a sequence alignment, and you see them right here. And then what they've done is they've analyzed and given you as well, below the sequence, what the structural component was. So these little rods mean helices. So it looks like this is a, you know, here was a pretty good alignment. You aligned all the helices here, a really a big range of alignment here. This seems to be um, a little bit more variability into here. Some had long helices that were added. Some had a short helix that was inserted. They get an agreement here, and these are, um, I think, those are the, the strands, and then the, the uh, I, don't, I don't even know if it shows the coils on this. So that's one way of looking at the format. And you see very quickly, yeah, they look related somehow. And I can sort of see where the dominant regions are. Um, another form of that output, instead of drawing little pictures here, you draw something um, that looks like a sequence, but on a four or five letter code. It also represents secondary structure. Um, here are this, this is the same sequence alignment we had before. The, 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 the format here is known in the field as the cl Clustall format. And you'll see today you can, with Anarag's uh, program, um, you can make it produce several different uh, formats. You have to change something. And we'll be dealing primarily one for sequences. It's called the fast A format. It has a little arrow, the name of the protein, and then below it, the, the sequence for that one protein. And then it comes the next one, little arrow, and then its sequence. And the sequences can also contain the alignment, so there'll be little gaps, but they won't be all put one on top of each other like here in the so-called clustal format, right? Now, um, as I said, the stuff down below, instead of drawing like a little cylinder wherever I have the helices, I put H. 
right? And now where I had strand should be E, right? Those were those little arrows. Now, reason of doing this um, is another format, but it's also typically the format that is used by algorithms that d uh, produce uh, secondary structure predictions. So maybe you start with your sequence and you do all sorts of analysis. You look for active sites, you look for key signatures. And maybe you do also a secondary structure prediction to even get an idea. Should I be looking into the class of alpha helical proteins or should I be looking in the class of alpha beta proteins? Or where should I be looking? And it's anything that you can do to sort of help narrow down the search. So this is another possible format that you can be using, okay? Now, um, in the last part of the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, of your tutorial, uh, we'll give you some time to go on and make use of these other web tools and, 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 and some of their sites and go into some of the other databases. So there are going to be databases for structure, PDB. There are going to be databases for uh, just the sequences like SwissProt, um, uh, the American ones like PIR. There's the genomic sequences that are in GenBank, and, and you sort of find um, they're all mirrored more or less uh, in our national the databases. In fact, when I would first taught a course about bioinformatics and computational biology, and I was having the students go into all these different databases, and one student asked me if this was against the law. Uh, and I thought that was amusing. All right. um, no, it's not against the law. You're all invited to get on your web and surf through those databases, and they each have sort of their own uh, ways of interacting with them and downloading information. It's not completely standardized, but if you're just dealing with sequences, everybody accepts FASTA, normally a CLUSTAL, and, and perhaps a, a GCG format, which is named after one of the first companies that did a lot of the bioinformatics tool for sequences. Okay, <clears throat> so one of the first places that you're going to go to is our, uh, is our National um, Center for Bio Inf Biological Information, NCBI. It's in Washington, D.C. It's a part of our NIH. It's in our National Library of Medicine. And as I said, they mirror about everything. And um, they have... Uh, pride themselves on having all the genomes there. Um, even when companies do them, like you heard a lot, like uh, as I said, about this competition, say for the human genome between the public sector represented by people working there and the private sector, Venter, who at that time was leading like Tiger. Um, so they'll have their information will all be stored there. And uh, one of the first things I'll have you do is to go and pick out the, uh, the entire genome of Methanococcus yanashi. As I said, that's a, that's a genome that's near and dear to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, it's, it's a sequence, it's a genome that is really near and dear to us because, you know, it was done here. Carl Vose uh, and, and Gary Olson and their co-workers presented it in science. I think the complete one came out, well, here's the reference, 1996. And if you ever have a chance to hear Carl Vose talk, I really do encourage you to do it, or I definitely encourage you to look at his papers on the evolution not only the universal phylogenetic tree, but the evolution of the cell. He tells also a very nice story about how difficult it was to even establish that these three domains of life existed. Because as he puts it, when you first discovered them, an important sequence, you could get it published in science. If you came up with the second sequence that did the same thing, um, but maybe from a different organism, then you would publish it like in nucleic acids. And if they, uh, if you came up with the third one, they go, eh, we're not interested, right? So you go, well, how am I going to prove there are three domains of life if I never get to publish the third one and show how it's compared to the other ones? 
And uh, while we all laughed, this was a real source of utter frustration uh, uh, for him, and which I thank heavens it is now long gone, and his sort of leadership role in the field is really established. And this, I hopefully, goes to show you just sort of how much information is available. Not only is the entire you know, DNA structure there, you can click on any part of this. There are about 1,700 genes represented here, and they've been classified by different functions. And I'm going to ask you to go in and pick out of these uh, the category where you should go to find out information, say, about tRNA synthetase. Now, you'll notice that tRNA synthetase, or tRNA, is not listed there at all. So you have to think a little bit. Uh, like uh, in that dogma picture that I didn't give you guys, um, but explained so well, um, is that you'll figure out into which of those categories do you think this tRNA um, uh, synthetizes, where it should belong. And if you go into there, you'll be able to then pull out all the sequences. And if you know a little bit about the genetic code, you may start asking yourself, well, look, I showed you the picture of these synthetases at the beginning of the lecture, and I showed you the part where it loads the tRNA, and I showed you the part where it interacts with the anticodon part of the, of the tRNA. Now, if you know something about the genetic code, there aren't just like 20 different codes for the 20 different amino acids, and there's these base triplets that code for any particular amino acid. In fact, the table, which I also give you in the tutorial, you know, that's it's much larger. You could have some of the amino acids have as many as uh, five different ba triplet base uh, bases, codons, that code for a particular amino acid. So naively, you may think that you should have like um, maybe, you know, 60 of these things or 40 or you don't know how many. So we're asked you to go in there and take a look at them, and the surprise about the system was initially they found fewer than 20, and that didn't seem to make sense. Like, is this guy missing an amino acid that it never uses in making proteins? <clears throat> and part of the problem was <clears throat> that there is even some <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> variability. In the, in the way that the tRNA gets charged. Most of the things that I've been talking about are the so-called direct uh, pathway, where there's sort of a unique um, tRNA synthetase that recognizes um, this amino acid and, you know, and puts it uh, and, uh, and loads it. And, but other times, there are other t uh, tRNA synthetases Oh, excuse me, I'm pointing at the wrong place. This is a synthetase. This is actually the, the tRNA that's supposed to have the anticodon for this, for glue. This is the uh, tRNA synthetase that has the anticodon for uh, glutamine. Um, <clears throat> but you notice in both cases, they have the same protein here, or s somewhat looks like it's the same. But what happens here, it does it in one direct step. It, uh, this protein then loads this amino acid onto this tRNA, and then it goes away. This one first loads um, onto the wrong, looks like, the wrong tRNA, a different amino acid, and then it has to go through several steps until it gets loaded with the right one. So that's called an indirect pathway. So sometimes, as I said, this protein can be loading the wrong amino acid onto the uh, the tRNA. And um, so there were only a, like a fewer than, than 20 that really did it in a direct way, and some of them were being made in a more indirect way using these other proteins. <clears throat> so again, um, this just brought back the structure, um, and uh, we'll be concentrating on this region, and um, uh, these anticodon regions, as they say, are not there in all the, uh, the tRNA synthetases. Now, the next place that I'll have you guys uh, visit on the web 
you'll be going into, and I'm sorry, it got chopped off here, is to call a Swiss prod. Uh, this is a good place to start if you just want to type in a keyword like tRNA synthetase or, or aspartyl tRNA synthetase, and you can pull up this. And, um, and it starts telling you a little bit about the sequence. Where do you find it in the cell, which is useful. Uh, once you start thinking and using more of this bioinformation that is out there. Uh, tells you what family it belongs to. And here it starts doing the cross-referencing. So you'll find out easy things like, is there a structure for this known? Um, what do I know about its domain structure? You can go to PFAM or ProDome. Um, what about other active sites? If you looked in that reaction that I showed you, it seems to also need ATP to help do this reaction. Well, where does that bind? Where is that? All this, all these different data, uh, all these different databases are containing information about uh, various activities and functions of any of the proteins that are out there. So, for example, I also had mentioned earlier this blocks uh, database that. Uh, is the one that was developed by Heinkopf and Heinkopf to be able to do those substitution matrices that you use for sequence comparison uh, activities. This will go and see, well, are there blocks of these active sites? So very useful are these PFAM, this blocks, prosites, prodome, and if there was additional structural information, uh, it would refer you back to the PDB or some other structural database. So. In fact, it tells you automatically there is an entry there, so you can go find it if you want. If you go over to PFAM, you get this funny little diagram. Uh, you'll see no structures, uh, at least not immediately. Eventually, there'll, there'll be a link back to the PDB database, but what it's designed to do is to first just try to give you the architecture of the protein, that there are several domains. This one only concentrates on the anticodon domain, and the catalytic domain. And if I had picked another one, you would have seen some other insertion domains popping up. Um, and it just does a, gives you a quick, very easy overview of all the different structures that are out there for that particular type of uh, amino acid uh, tRNA synthetase. All right, so as I said, in almost everything you want to do, uh, when you're working in that so-called twilight zone of where you have very low sequence identity to anything either in the that's structurally known or perhaps even into other sequences, uh, the first thing that you try to do uh, is to build up some type of profile. And the way to build up profiles for sequences is to work with Clustal, right? And it's sort of, uh, uh, well, it's one of the methods that's been tried and tested, and, and the algorithm uh, seems to function well. Uh, it's m mostly you have a choice between that and certain hidden Markov methods, which we'll get to in just a moment. And it's very easy uh, to use. I know one of you was asking me, like, how do I get into these databases? And this is very typical of almost everything that's available to you on the web. You come in and you just paste in some sequence here. And as I said, I've used the format of Fast A, which is just the arrow, some abbreviation. I took the sequence directly from the PDB structure, put it in, and asked it to find all the other things that were related to this uh, aspartyl tRNA synthetase. And you can see here the other formats that are accepted. And um, unfortunately, there's not one form that they all use. All are financed by different people. Some are financed by the Europeans. Some are financed by our government. So you'll never get them to agree. What you can get out of Clustal, it will bring up all the sequences for the Spartal. And if you ask it to, it will also do a dendrogram of them, um, of showing uh, the molecular phylogenetic tree for all the Spartal um, uh, sequences. Now this hopefully is gonna look like the one that you generate in your tutorial this afternoon. I'm having you go through and use MATLAB, and I'll have you do this just to do sequence. I could have had you, had I given you the structural measure, you could have gotten a sense for the distances here from structure, and I could have asked you to generate also the one based on you know, a, a structural profile. 
but I didn't want to, to do that in addition. So we'll do just molecular phylogenetic trees sort of the way that Carl and uh, other uh, microbiologists would be doing those. And you'll get something like that. And if you were to read this, it looks like these two are more closely related. This is the most distantly related to everybody else, right? And if you turn my plot around, this is what you'll see, hopefully, if all goes well, for I think these are uh, a subset of those proteins. I threw in one or two that are far outliers, just so you see that uh, what it means to be sort of from the sequence part, very distantly related. So these have like 54% sequence identity to one another. This has perhaps, I think, 18% sequence identity to these guys. But as you saw from the beginning part of these lectures this morning, they all have the same structure. At least the core structure is the same. This may have insertions and deletions, but that core structure is really the same. All right, now where did we get the, the structures to do our um, study on the evolution of structure? Uh, there, again, you could go back to the PDB database. Um, it's a little bit harder because you tend to get the whole protein. Nobody's broken it up that nicely for you into domains. But this one did. It's called the scope database. They take the PDB database, they look for domains, and they put them into categories and give them a name, and it's much easier for you to search for them. And I think we have an exercise too where you'll go there and it'll have listed for any one entry maybe two just for the anticodon and the catalytic domain or maybe three or four entries because there'll be an inserted domain that'll also pull up for you. And so what we did is we went there, a combination of this and our so-called astral database which is connected to this one, we pulled out all the ones <clears throat> that are in the catalytic domain. And you'll see what's, what uh, the nice feature that scope does, and in fact, I believe the person who, who developed this um, um, uh, received a prize because it's been so useful um, uh, to have this information around, to take them and not only categor categorize them into domains, but also try to categorize them according to various classes, fold types, superfamilies, families, and as you get this is general, this is getting more specific. So under the classes, if I were to sort of click here and go back a couple steps into this hierarchy, I'd see that the classes they are talking about here tend to be, is it alpha, is it you know beta, is it alpha beta structure, is it a membrane protein, or is it disordered? There's sort of like five, six classes. So this one is obviously, I think what I pulled off was the so-called anti-codon binding domain. Um, this sort of alpha helix, uh, these sort of beta sheets that are up there were primarily beta sheets. <clears throat> okay. It gave a name to that fold. In that particular anticodon uh, region, it has what is known as an OB fold, much like we were showing you uh, the class ones had a so-called Rossman fold. That's a certain pattern of, of, of sheets and helices, how they're connected together. This one's called the OB fold. Um, it belongs into that super family of, of general family of, of, of proteins that bind nucleic acids. So it's binding and interacting with the acceptor arm, or not the acceptor arm, but the anticodon binding, anticodon region of the tRNA synthetase. Uh, it is known in, in that whole family of anticodon binding domains, proteins that interact with that particular domain. And then it tells you uh, which particular uh, amino acid tRNA synthetase are we talking about. And it gives you several different ones, uh, choices here. Uh, maybe they're from, uh, from different organisms. Okay, so this is how we get the structural information. Then what you'll do um, is if you remember back in that phylogenetic tree, we said two of them had like 54% sequence identity. So if you superimpose them, they're going to get like very similar. And if you superimpose them 
based on using either a sequence alignment method or a structural alignment method, they're going to look pretty much the same. In this case, with high sequence identity, it doesn't matter which method that you use, you'll all get the same answer. Now, if you pick two that have 17% sequence identity and tell it to use Smith-Waterman or Needleman Wunsch or any of the other dynamic al uh, programming algorithms that we have discussed, uh, this thing will be shifted. And maybe as bad, I think, uh, I don't know, where's Felix? Was it 20 angstroms in their exercise? It, right. So when they have like 17% uh, sequence identity, if you try to use a sequence method, you'll get an, an alignment that'll get, be about 20 uh, angstroms uh, RMSD. If you then take those and tell this uh, program that we're having you guys using its sequence editor, it, it'll do one of those structural alignment methods, please go and align them by structure, you'll see a dramatic improvement. So <clears throat> I think it's pretty obvious um, if you have enough structures, you should by all means use the structural alignment as the trusted answer to, to build a profile and use, build that profile using any of the methods that we just discussed, like um, uh, born CE when it is applicable or these stamp uh, methods. <clears throat> and just to show you that when you're in this program, we really tried to set it up for you that it is as simple as possible so you don't have to be bothered by the details of these algorithms. Um, and it's just really a bunch of buttons you push here to either get a structural alignment or to get the sequence alignment. And if you notice, we discussed already in the morning, what does this mean, the substitution matrix? If you push this button, you'll see you'll get about 100 different choices. Blossom 50, 60, 70 for sequences that are more closely related to one another. Unfortunately, there is no blossom 20 percent, you know, 20, which is what we have in this case. So this is the one that allows the largest uh, deviation um, uh, or distance homology possible in them. And these are the typical gap penalties that you should be putting in there to do the real exercise. To do the toy exercise uh, that we set up for you to learn about <laughs> the, the algorithms and the dynamic program. And, and to calculate out by hand the structural, uh, the, the trace back and the structural alignment, we have used just a simple gap penalty. I think it's set it equal to, I don't know what we did, eight, I think it was, um, just so it makes it much easier to work your way through that entire H matrix. But here, please uh, set them to what is given to you in the, um, in the exercise. All right, um, now I just I threw these two uh, uh, slides in there just to bring home, again, one last time, this point. We sh saw pictures where we took all the amino uh, acid, um, uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetases that load all the 20 different <clears throat> amino acids, all to the all different tRNA synthetases, and remember those Amino acids are really different from one another. Some are polar, some are hydrophobic, but that doesn't matter. The core, where those amino acids are loaded, they, it may have very low sequence identity, but the structure, and that's the Q part, that's the dark blue, is highly conserved over that core. There are some regions of loops where it's not, but the structure is highly conserved. So the backbone is conserved. The amino acids are not because to have a, a, a region where you can dock, say, a, hydro, uh, uh, a charged amino acid is going to be much different than the environment you need to dock a hydrophobic one. So if you were to look at sequence identity, it's going to be much lower. So this again says the message that we have to take seriously when you're working on things like protein structure prediction there is much more conservation of structure than there is of sequence. In fact, this has to adapt to be able to bind different types of amino acids. Now, occasionally you'll see a spike here, like how can you have greater sequence identity than you have structural identity? Well, the reason being is in this region, these things are maybe a, a loop, and even though you have the exact same structure, there's so much fluctuation uh, 
uh, in the various confirmation that that gives a, a lower value of the structural measure than you would expect. And that occurs in a few different places. And then really they're just uh, averaging over the various conformational uh, results of the, <coughs> of the structures. And if we'd, again, to, just to go back, to give you the data behind those pictures that I showed you, the overlap of all those structures, of those core structures, and you'll see them again in VMD, again, in, in part due to some wonderful scripts that Barry wrote that allows you to overlap them and then to study what are the conserved domains. And I asked him, I don't know if he has this working, that we can look at the dual space, the things that are uh, not conserved. Um, you'll see that the overall sequence uh, identity, well, you, you, this you won't see, but I'll tell you, is about 10% sequence identity. If you t pick out the two that are closely related to one another in the same domain of life, the U bacteria, they're about 50% sequence identity. And the structure part tells you with a Q of, of centered around about 0.4 to 0.8. Remember from yesterday's talk um, about ab initio folding that a Q of 0.4 means that like 40% of the native contacts are correct and it looks like a, a homolog. Blurred, but it looks like a pretty good homolog. So the last sort of a web method that I would like to have you guys look at, um, which is a sort of competing with uh, Clustal in, in developing profiles, is this method called uh, hidden Markov methods. Now, We've applied it to a particular example. This again, we being Anurag, Seti in my group, was doing some modeling of membrane proteins. He used a version of it that's sort of designed for transmembrane um, hidden Markov methods. It's a neural network approach. And what we were interested in doing was predicting the structure of, pretending we didn't know the structure of um, BR, but we knew it, say, for bovine rhodopsin, we knew it for halorhodopsin and maybe one other. So we had four structures. We pretended we didn't know one of them, uh, developed a profile with three, uh, gave, it the structure, gave it the sequence of the fourth one, predicted its structure, and then compared the predicted with the existing X-ray structure. And what I'll do now is just go through very slowly uh, the steps that this thing uh, uses. So first, um, we use STAMP to structurally align them. So this alignment was produced out of STAMP. The uh, only thing I've taken off here are the, um, the rows indicating the agreement of the secondary structure, because I just want you to concentrate now on the sequence part to build in a profile. So these are the three we assume are known. And this gives you a little bit of a, the, the blue just indicates certain residues that are conserved or residue types. You feed that s multiple sequence alignment with gaps into this program on the web, and it gives you a profile. So let's go back a second. Um, I guess the numbers aren't here, but let's say this thing is like 200 long. All right. Oops. So uh, out of that alignment uh, that I gave it from STAMP, it builds this profile. And I can only show you a portion of it. So it's say if it were 200 long, this would be the amino acid sequence would go down here. And then at each position in that alignment, I have another row up here of 20 uh, values of all the different amino acid types that can be in that position. And those scores are telling you what's the likelihood of finding each of those amino acids there. They're also giving me information about certain transitions that can take place in this neural network of procedure of encoding the structure. Like, uh, was this position then followed by a gap? Was this position followed um, by a different kind of amino acids? So this has several states on them. And this, the next line down here gives you the transition probabilities. So when you're building up this hidden Markov model, you need to have identify states and transition probabilities to go from one state to the next. 
All right. So when you're, you have this profile now encoded, you have a, a, the hidden Markov method set up, you now bring in the third sequence and tell it to align it. And it does. And from that alignment, you now build a structure. Um, well, first you can maybe, if you're being pedagogical about this whole thing, you would go first and compare the profile uh, al profile alignment that you got with the hidden Markov method. Uh, you would try to compare it to the one that you got using Clustal. And now if, you've, if I were just to flip back and forth, you'll see that in the big regions, uh, uh, there's a lot of agreement, but there are some variabilities here and here. So uh, there are definite differences. So let's go back one. That's a hidden Markov. Look at these regions. Here's a little bit different. This looks the same. But there is something different because just, they just don't look identical to you. So you can start studying that more hmm, systematically, excuse me, back this way. Okay? So you can study what are the differences that you get. And if you get a different alignment, of course, when you try to build a structure of this sequence onto any of these, you're going to get a slight variation. So now we built a structure. Um, and we built it putting in all three templates into a program called Modeler. And it takes those uh, backbones, puts on the side chains of the sequence we're interested in, does a minimal amount of, of molecular dynamics to sort of smooth out the regions. If there are any gaps, maybe puts in, I think there was a, a longer gap here that we cut off. And this is how well we did in predicting the structure of BR using the other templates. Now, I think that was an exercise one of you was interested in doing to sort of test your own modeling uh, methods. And this is a very good thing to do. So um, I, don't, I didn't give you the RMSD on this thing. Uh, you can see, of course, there are definite in the loop regions uh, more mistakes. It seems that the tilt of the helices has got off uh, wrong, but in this case, it did seem to do a little bit better job at getting uh, where the helices is supposed to start and stop. Now, I think because this has been trained in part, I believe, for membrane proteins, there's probably an additional bioinformatics information in there uh, that people have used just to be able to really accurately assess where does the thing go into the membrane and what part is exterior to the membrane. So <clears throat> last but not least, let me give an acknowledgement to who did um, all the work uh, preparing this uh, tutorial. Uh, I think these people will, uh, except for Patrick, who's actually supposed to be taking the tutorial, an anorag, um, will be uh, available to help you guys in the computer room. So it's again, it's Felix and then uh, Barry from the resource and, and, and Taras uh, Pogorello, Pogorello, and they'll all be available to help you. Uh, and as I said, the, the work that was done on the evolution of structure and the, its further development was done by Patrick O'Donohue, and the work on comparing and developing models of membrane proteins was done by Anna Ragsetti. And I think they may be there for some parts of the tutorial, although they were our guinea pigs on many of the items in there. So thank you very much. So I assume there's some time for questions, right? Uh-huh, please. Could you speak just a little louder? I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Those are just like what I would call rather it, building a, a trivial homology model. If something only has like, if it has 80% sequence identity, that means 80% of the sequence uh, residues are the same. Just mutate those few, but uh, what rotomer state do I put them in? What do I do?
Well, oh, okay. I mean, when you say, okay, uh, if I understand you correctly, what you're talking about is I want to do um, just a m mutation studies and I'm going to use, um, <clears throat> you know, a program, I'm going to take off that one amino acid side chain, put on another one, <clears throat> and then I'll use molecular dynamics to equilibrate the structure. Uh, you know, much like we were talking yesterday on the classical force fields, I said, as I said, one check that you have assigned the, the energies correctly, you have to do a molecular dynamics run and then you have to do population studies, histogram techniques to see if you're visiting all the right uh, dihedral angles and the distributions correctly. The same way like with the rotor states, those are just dihedrals into the side chain. So you've got to give it a chance to equilibrate to put it into that. I think that that's what you mean. I mean, there's still a whole other areas. Like we talked about these coarse grain methods, and I think I, I saw Professor Klein come in. He'll use a coarse grain method or tell you about it, a very nice one they developed to study membrane proteins and the insertions of proteins into them. We've used them also for protein folding, and that was the work also of, uh, of uh, part of, of TARIS, where we've actually combined both the knowledge base, coarse grain, with the full atom, or you can just try to do it on a coarse grain model. So you use molecular dynamics all over the place. It's just that full atom simulations typically, as you know, have small time steps and you're limited in the time scales that you can get to if you can't use, like, couple it with SMD. With full atom molecular dynamics. You can do molecular dynamics using our coarse grain or anybody else's coarse grain uh, energy function. Actually, uh, just to be really precise, uh, 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 Coleman, um, Professor Coleman, I think, worked, I forgot, uh, with one of the predictors, and he took their structures, and they published a study of trying to improve it using amber. That was one study. There is, though, as I say, there is such a, a wide variety of methods that are out there. So now, uh, one of the problems is, of course, uh, trying to use molecular dynamics, and if you tr do it in solution, so one of the ways uh, that people have been working on is to change all those charm amber force field parameters to allow for distant dependent dielectric. So you do away with the solvent that speeds things up. So that's sort of guy coming from the direction that you want to talk about. But those have not, I mean, I think there was somebody who tried using those in, in the contest and just didn't work well at all. But that doesn't mean anything, you know. Uh, it may mean that given enough time, the, it will develop. But, you know, in general, the traditional conventional ones uh, didn't do much improvement, although Coleman got it to sort of undo one bad connection. And that was considered already a, a pretty good achievement. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I think what is the main problem, at least we, from our own work on, on structural prediction that we see, and where we think, uh, you know, if, if, all right, l let me back up and say, when you're looking at how the, the force fields, the traditional class ones we're, ca we're calling them, were being uh, uh, optimized in the strategy for it, they were using smaller fragments where they could use, you know, um, uh, ab initio methods uh, to sort of, develop some form of the truth and comparing the, the structural features to that. And then you try to put, build up the bigger blocks from the little ones and they give you a warning, like do one more round of iteration on the bigger segments to see if you really are getting the right population of A and B forms, say, of DNA. Okay, they've been trained on local things. So it's probably, if, when they're weak, it's of the terms that would give overall rise to the collapse. So I think once you've got the molecule collapsed, you can go back to using a more full atom one, but you, to get the driving force, those long range forces, to get it to sort of start getting the tertiary contacts incorrectly, those are probably not as strong as they could be. So that's why we tried ourselves to see what we could do to improve those, first by working on a case where you know the answer and see how much of a driving force you have to get in order to be able to correctly fold something. Yeah, you know, uh, along those lines, one of the things that we keep in mind in, in developing these coarse grain models is that we, we try to, you know, if you remember the energy function, break it up into short range, intermediate range, long range. And it, it's, we fooled around with making one more dominant than the other. And I think that when you're folding or looking at these larger molecules, uh, and it, you know, this balance between long range and the short range interactions is not so clear. And they, and they don't have a, it hasn't been tested in developing these force fields. So like when we do it, and, and we, we, you can't get the thing to collapse too fast because then you, have a, then you have to sort of blow it back apart to start getting, if you don't get the things collapsing and getting the right ordering of say of strands and stuff. But uh, so we use as a rule, try to make things like one third, one, one third, one third from each of those range, and letting no one term dominate. <clears throat>
I agree. why I spent a lot of time, uh, but we didn't show the results here, of working what we call a representative set. Um, you, the programs, you, you, you normally have these PDB databases mirrored all over the place. We have it mirrored here at the University of Illinois, so it's, you know, and we have FASC uh, hookups, so it's essentially seen by my computer. So we spent some time um, developing um, you know, what is a non-redundant uh, set, and what is a representative set, so we can work with a subset of those 20,000 structures. Okay, so. Um, you know, uh, uh, sure, uh, like we have a little Perl script that downloads everything every night, every th new structure that's put into the PDP database, you can just go in through their FTP site and download each structure, and, it's, uh, and our local mirrored site is uh, changed every day for that. So you don't have to use the, in fact, you know, that's the trouble <clears throat> with all these servers, great, but they're really all meant for you to put in one or two sequences at a time. If you're going to do this work seriously, then you must download the databases, have it either in your computer center or put it on you know, some disks, you know, and the number is growing, uh, but you have to have it locally available to do rapid searches, and we do for everything. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I think you're, you're next, sorry. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not just the ad seeking setup that's been difficult. It's the fact that it's not manageable from uh, seeking commands and stuff. So how much of that stuff is going to be used to seek commands and commands? You know, um, I, I mean, I jokingly had this slide about, you know, welcome to the twilight zone. Um, that, you know, it, it, even there, it depends on the context that you're working with. If <clears throat> if you know anything about this sequence, like if somebody at least can categorize its function, then you, sure, you can work down even with the 25 to, you know, and lower sequence identity, um, or try to, um, uh, at least over the core parts that, or the active sites. And if I said if you go and look at ProSite or know something about it, you can key in on parts of it. But in general, say for like these contests like CASP, um, and it's not sure at all 
what its real function is at times or if there's nothing known about the structures of proteins that have the similar function. And you know, you don't want to be, by the way, misled. If I told you this protein loads an amino acid onto tRNA, which structure would you pick? The class one or the class two that I showed you? And I told you they evolved totally different, but they both do the same job. So even the thing of looking with something that has the same function can screw you up. So, you know, what do you do in that case? Of course, you make models on both structures. You know, and there's no hard, fast rule, but once you start getting into the 20%, and you have to check that you're not fooling yourself. You know, as I said, those class one, class two is a prime example. <coughs> GAF. It's called GAF. Well, yes. So I shouldn't need hmm. Yeah, no. I mean, I, as I said, I don't care which, you know, I, I try to emphasize what are the general considerations in doing this for classical force field uh, development, whether it is a full atom one or is a coarse grain one. Somewhere in there is a training set, right? And that is going to influence your parameters, and you have to try and make it as diverse as possible, and you have to test it. You know, at the very least, you should be able to get back the training set correct, but then you have to test outside of it, right? And it is true. Like there, in, uh, not only is is it a difference in the training set, but there's a different there's a difference in the functional form. And just in general, these ones developed for organic molecules, the so-called class two ones. And the GAF, Merck, I mean, Merck is sort of the one that's built in, comes with uh, when you get uh, charm. They will also give you that force field. GAF is sort of the equivalent one that comes with amber. They um, have been trained on thousands of protein, uh, thousands of small molecules, but it's also a totally different energy function. You remember, every term goes up to higher orders. It's cubic, quadratic, uh, quartic, right? So, yeah, there seems to be... S the Preliminary results, but you know everybody sounds optimistic on their web page. I don't know the difference. But okay. Ask more general questions. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> um, you know, we had some indication. Like as I said, uh, I think it was a question this gentleman asked, like, well, how do you know, you know, we have an energy function. We see a score. We saw the gap. The gap wasn't very big. The, the overall score that we got was not particularly high. We knew we had made maybe just got half of it correct. We sort of knew this. We didn't give it a very la large confidence. And... So you have some indications. But when you have 70 structures you have to do within six weeks, you don't spend a lot of time with the evaluation. You'll maybe you'll, you'll get it, you'll run it through one or two other things to look at and rank them and then send them off. We would love to be so systematic. But you know, this is something you have, to, those of us who are in the field of structure prediction, protein folding, we sort of have to do it. I mean, it's loosely, indirectly connected to our funding. 
So we do it, but it's not something you want to do, right? Uh, we're not a company, right? And so, uh, you know, it's like me coercing my poor students to do it for six weeks so we can get back to doing our research, right? So yes, you can be much more systematic and you get better results and we did much better this time than we had done in previous times, in part because of the wonderful organizational talents of Patrick O'Donohue, one of the students of the group. He just put a table and said, and then we just sat around and defended uh, uh, whether we should submit something or not. So just being a little bit more systematic, yes, certainly does help you. So uh, we have. A, I, I just need, want to start with a few announcements. First, uh, I don't know. Maybe some of you saw that we have uh, uh, that we have now on the website of the meeting uh, um, a, a, a photo gallery, and so the one of them is the group photo that we took uh, last week. But there are some other ones. Maybe I show them to you quickly. So you may enjoy, of course, you can also look at them when you go home. Uh, so you may recognize some people there. And uh, so we are, we are, Wu Gao was trying to make, take all those photographs. And uh, uh, you can, of course, download them also when you're at home. And so few more pictures will be added to this. <laughs> so, so okay. So then uh, they are available on the main on the main uh, uh, on the main summer school page under when you go here to the program. Then you go here. Then you see here the photo gallery, and so there you can look. Now we have to quickly consider two items on the program. The first one is the beauty contest entries are due tomorrow morning. Uh, and then tomorrow we will be uh, deciding during the morning uh, which of your entries we can, uh, we can present then on Thursday. So this is this item here. So tomorrow morning before the first um, uh, lesson, I would like you to ask to give us on a piece of paper the title of your beauty contest entry, mainly you know simulation of protein X, and then uh, a very brief, uh, like five, six line uh, summary of what you did. Don't be long, rather be short, and so rather three lines than 20 lines, so that basically we know what protein you are dealing or what mo biomolecular system you are dealing with and what you are doing. And then we have to make the choice, possibly among the entries, if we have too many entries, we basically try to get an idea how many presentations we can have. And since we can only have a finite number of presentations, we have to select. And then on Thursday evening, we will have then here in this room, the beauty contest, actually, let me just show you this, so this card there, so this is hard to see. And uh, so on Thursday, we will have then, um, so here, we will, we will meet then here, instead of meeting, instead of going to the computer labs, we will meet here at 7.30, and then we have your presentations, and then we have a vote on the, on the presentation, probably the way we just do that is that we, that we, uh, all presentations will be given. I don't know how many, you have to say five or six. And then at the end, then I, I ask you all to applaud and by the level of your noise, we will then rank them and uh, we find the winner. So we will be very precise as you see. Okay, so that will be the, the beauty contest. So you can then still work one evening to uh, tomorrow evening, uh, Wednesday evening on this on this contest. Then finally, we have arranged for you to see the NCSHK 
And so we have this one, as you see here, on Thursday and on Friday afternoon. And we have several tours there, six tours on Thursday and six tours on Friday. Uh, so that gives everybody an opportunity to see the cave. But since the cave is, a, is in a not a very big room and itself is, is a finite size, uh, there can only be eight people at e any of those tours. And so Jordi prepared um, tickets for the tours and he will now uh, hand them out to you. Oh, Marcus. Oh, Marcus, Marcus, sorry. I don't know why it's French, Jordi, sorry. So Marcus prepared the tickets and uh, now, how should we do that quickly? I would say it uh, doesn't really matter to which tour you go. So I would say you just, you just uh, hand them out. You, you give them, uh, you go along the rides, you give them until all the tickets are being used. So those of you who, who want, just take the ticket and then we give you one for ticket. There's enough for everybody, yes. Okay, good. Uh, so this is this is the points I have, and now uh, uh, you have a, you have a you have opportunities to ask questions. So tomorrow, tomorrow will be a. Tomorrow will be a lecture on the clusters, and now I will try to go there. So, it's there already? No, 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 no. It's on Wednesday. So, where is it? Do you see it? Wednesday is the uh, ah, here. Here? No. Here, here. here. So, so we expect that those who consider going to the cluster building session attend this lesson, this lecture, and after the lecture, we hand out tickets for the two um, hands on sessions three. one here, so for the three, one here, and two on Thursday. Okay. So any anything else? Oh, Rosemary. Ah. Um, so just a quick announcement. A number of you um, signed up to volunteer to write a day in the life of the summer school diary entries. I think you probably remember who you are. Um, <laughs> we'll be meeting tonight for dinner, uh, for a working dinner at the Urbana Bread Company at 7 o'clock. So the 10 of you who signed up are invited to this. Um, the Urbana Bread Company is on Goodwin at Oregon. You cross Goodwin every day on your way from Hendrick House to the Beckman. So you've probably seen it. And you can find me after this and I'll give you clearer directions. Um, so I'll hand it back over to Klaus now. So, so there were 10 uh, kind participants who uh, volunteered after being uh, forced a little maybe uh, to write these diary entries. And so uh, you, can, you can meet uh, uh, Rosemary afterwards and she can explain to you then ag again where you will be meeting uh, this evening seven o'clock for, no, seven, no, this would be little, that would overlap, maybe a little earlier. At when do you want to meet? Six o'clock? Let's say six o'clock, and she will give you directions to the bread company, and, uh, and you are invited for dinner there. Okay, so further questions? 
Okay, then have a good afternoon. Enjoy the tutorial.